Today, I'm talking with Patrick Dubois. We talked about different ways of learning, about listening to our bodies to avoid burning out, how he accidentally invented DevOps and how that changed the quality of life for others. I'm Yves Hanul from Who's Agile. My pronouns are he and him. Welcome to my channel. You see a lot of Agilists around me on this screen. If you want to hear me interviewing, please click that subscribe button because these are the people that I've invited so far. If you think I'm missing people, let me know in the comments. And that like button, well, if you liked today's interview, don't forget to click it. Hello and good evening. And good evening for me as uh, from Ghent. And with me, I have Patrick. Good evening, Patrick. Patrick. Good evening. I don't know. How, how should I pronounce it in English? I'm not sure. We only talk in Dutch usually. Uh, it doesn't matter, <laughs> I guess. Uh, yeah, like Patrick and, and, is what most Americans say, I think. But. Yeah, what most Americans say. Well, and for the people that uh, that don't know it, let, let me bring on screen. I'm in Belgium, in Ghent. and. Patrick is uh, not that far from me, actually. This is probably the closest conversation I had. If it's uh, Berlin, if you're still living there, if I'm correct. Yes, that's me. Yeah. That's you. So let's uh, show it. And it is, um, it's Friday evening at 17.28. So I assume it's about the same time that we're still in the same time zone. Uh, that's uh, that's not usually, but uh, I think both of us we talk a lot with people in completely different time zones, and, and so this is um, what is it a homecoming one way or another because we've come come back uh, from a very long time. So I'm really happy that you're here. But for the people that don't know you, Patrick, introduce yourself. Okay, um, I am. An engineer uh, for a long time. Uh, I think I started my career in '93, also the year I got close to married. Um, mm. What people know from me is that um, I've done a lot of jobs. I have gray hair, so you know I've, I've done uh, several things. Uh, I think I you earned your hair, your gray hair. That's let's well, say yeah, it it's like still a little bit yellow, but <laughs> occasionally, right? It's it's getting there. Uh, I've done a lot of roles, uh, being developer, tester, manager. So, but I'll I'll usually stay hands on. Uh, but more and more, I'm I'm getting like a broader impact on companies. What most people know me for is my work I've done around DevOps, um, and I say that by accident I coined the term DevOps by calling an event called DevOps Days. I had no clue what I was doing that time, but it seems like excited then. Um, I've been promoting this ever since to the world uh, with a lot of help from others and kind of uh, been privileged to see that grow. Um, more recently, um, yeah, no, let me go back. That's 13 years in the making. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, then I've given 130 presentations on DevOps. So I looked at a lot of angles from different sides uh, in the organization. Um, and I'm trying to be a generalist, which is also in as much a specialist as possible. Um, and that could be you like to dive thing. deep into stuff, huh? Uh, that's... Uh, yes, but I usually do it for a couple of years, a short time, and, and then, then I have the motto of just enough that it is good enough for me to know and to understand what that role, what that job, what that domain does, and then I move on to something uh, else. So that's been my rolling way of every three, four years, I, I try to do something different, I try to adopt a new domain new role uh, to keep it excited for me. So while some people would call me specialist in some things, uh, that's only usual for a couple of years. And then that domain is somewhere in the back of my mind, but I, I'm on to something new. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's, that's how I saw you over the years. It's funny that you say you had no idea what you were doing when, when you launched that event. Uh, I would say I was the one who had no idea because I knew I was one of the few people who knew about the event and I wasn't going while even I was staying at home. It's still the one professionally my biggest mistake I ever made, <laughs> knowing about it, feeling the excitement that you and Chris and all the others were, were talking about. 
and for whatever strange reason well i know why but it's it's totally not important here uh why i didn't join at that moment but um I'm, i've been amazed and i'm happy to 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 join in and with the crew i would say um, i think we met actually maybe as a side note if i recall it well on a boot camp you were organizing <laughs> So um, yeah. we, I think we met before, but I was uh, promoting it, and then you were interested in joining, and so you, you, you came over in an evening that we indeed had the boot camp, and then you talked with the participants at that moment. But I think we talked at the XP Day Benelux uh, a year or two before already. But that's really the moment that we that we locked eyes. Let's put it like that. Yeah. That we knew. Okay, this is this is what this person is doing, and then we. We got to know much more uh where before we were both just participants or, or speakers at the same event but yeah just not really in contact but that, I, I still remember talking about um um uh your 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 url of your your blog with just enough and and everything yeah. that was uh, that we did that in um uh in Mechelen, not Mechelen, but close to Mechelen there that place indeed i just wanted to give you a shout out like uh, you were at that time i was looking a lot at agile before there were anything on devops and i think you were one of the inspiring people on looking at the human side and kind of like looking at the empathy of people so again shout out to you for that Thank you. Well, I, I have both the good and a bad feeling about that because XP Day Benelux, for example, uh, before that was indeed focusing very much on the technical side. And I'm one of the people, like you say, that brought in the, the human side. But today, if uh, next week, by coincidence, I'm going to XP Day Benelux, it's completely opposite. It's, there is almost no technology. And I feel bad about that because we miss it. There is definitely a need for much more technology we have if, if you ask me too much coaches that have never been in touch with technology and i don't say that every coach should be in touch but if you for example i'm now working at a large bank in the bunch of, of of coaches that are there we should have more people that have technology background than than we currently have and so it's i think there is that that balance that that swapped over to the wrong side and it will come back i'm, I'm sure it's there is no possible and you were part of for me that the, the interesting part is most people know well that in in corporates when they talk about it they think about the technology side about devops but there is actually a lot on the on the human side for me this is for example if you look at um continuous delivery uh that whole thing so some people say well what's the difference between that and devops DevOps for me focuses a lot more on on the human side, on the events. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, that the people who coined the book and who wrote the book uh, don't care about humans. Not at all. Uh, I would say, but it's yeah. We we need that balance. We need to to look at both sides. I think. Yeah, so that's already a good start. So let's move into that first question. What is something that people usually don't know about you, but has influenced you in in, in who you are? Um, uh, for a lot of people, I think I, I, I leave a lot of things in public, right. And, and I share a lot, so it's not that much of a thing, but I guess a lot of it predates from before I was maybe public. Uh, it, it wasn't until, mm -hmm. you know, 2008, that I was, uh, more advocating public. Um, people see me now more on having worked at, uh, kind of startups or kind of scale ups. Uh, I used to work a lot in government. <laughs> uh so that's mm -hmm. what a lot of people don't know and then going even further on a personality thing um i think until i was in i think how do you call it like sixth grade or something i probably had a fight every day on the schoolyard <laughs> wow okay that's something i didn't know <laughs> yeah um and so it was two ways it's like i i was one of a, the taller persons so I always was about like defending people uh, in a way that I, it felt like unjust. Uh, but when I moved maybe into the first uh, year after sixth grade, right, um, I was starting to do the same thing. On the, uh, I was in a new school and uh, somebody stopped me by having ninja moves. <laughs> like, <laughs> and they're like, whatever I did, it, it did make no impact on that person because he, he was countering for everything and uh 
in my head, this is also the moment where I kind of quiet down on this, uh, more, let's say, uh, doing any of the physical, you know, kind of fighting that uh, kids would do. Uh, and that made me grow up on that level. Anyway, that, that's a side note. Uh, I think most people would hopefully see me as a gentle person being inclusive and not being very kind of bullish. But I'm not saying I was bullish, but I was kind of doing it in well, a physical way. So. Well, what I'm hearing is that you want to defend people, but you did it also using force. And so you, you might have thought you were fighting the good fight, but you were still fighting. So I can imagine that teachers might not always see why you were doing stuff like that. And that, uh, yeah. But yeah, at home, that, I was the sweetest person ever, right? So. Oh, yeah. So, but that, that, yeah, yeah. Well, we both have kids that are teenagers and we know that there is a, a thing that you don't know as parents and maybe you don't want to know. And so, <laughs> on the other hand, I also noticed that if I just look at it, the, um, the friends from my children that they they behave much sweeter in my home than my children in a sense that they that when when I'm here when I have friends over they're always like yeah when I tell the parents that oh they behaved really and they were like very nice saying thank you and helping out and like really they don't do that at home well I assume my kids have similar things in your side that's something we we usually don't talk enough about I, I think uh, we we see the well. The, the adulting thing or the thing that uh, teenagers do. Um, but I think it's good to also see that, that usually they behave better at, uh, at another side as well. <laughs> there is, and, and we've talked a lot also at conferences about uh, the struggles we had with teenagers. I would say there, there's definitely <laughs> things that we share there. Your yes. kids are a little bit older than mine, but I think there are still war stories that we can share. I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we, we got older, let's say it like exactly. that. Exactly. We don't know yet, but kind of. <laughs> well, if, if, I'm, I'm always saying that I helped my daughter in, in winning the, the what is it, the Olympics in eye, eye roll movements that I helped her winning. <laughs> that, so that <laughs> and I, I try at least every day to make something that she says, yeah, that you're busy with it again. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah. That's, uh, Which actually, is, uh, it's just, uh, again, a little anecdote because you're talking about kids, a lot about Agile and DevOps and collaboration. I remember in the early days, my kids were asking, so dad, what do you do? You're like sit in like a circle, you discuss things. And I said, oh, well, you yeah, know, we, 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 we talk about what we're going to do next and, and kind of how this is hard. And then funny enough, like the concept of glad, sad, mad came up and they're saying, well, you know, in our school, <laughs> we do this, we have this kind of, place where we sit together with the whole uh, class and we discuss things and then we defend it, uh, kind of say what we're going to do uh, and we'll talk things out and, and the teacher helps us to kind of like talk things through. So it, it is ironically often that whatever we do in our job is a little bit like hurting cats and hurting kids and kind of that way, uh, but definitely yeah. right. Yeah, I, I remember that, um, well, my, my son at some point learned about the mad glad sat the, the four basic emotion, but he at school, the oldest one at that point was only allowed to say one emotion. So he could be either mad, glad, sad or afraid, but he could not combine where I was combining it all the time. And yeah, I'm, I'm still confused if that's better at school for that age or, or not. But it did help us because at one point, and I'm not sure if I said it already publicly here, but at one point he was saying putting to bed and we, we had to kind of practice to, to, to say, to use that. And he was saying, oh, I'm sad because the babysitter is coming. And I was like, there's no babysitter coming. Why, why are you saying that? But then later it, it dawned on me that it was Tuesday and normally on a Tuesday I would go out with my, my, par uh, with my, my wife and we would... Um, go for a cooking class and so normally on a tuesday would be a babysitter and so he was sad that it, well, we were putting him to bed before the babysitter was there and before we were leaving but we didn't plan that but somehow at the age of five or six he already knew tuesday babysitter and and that was a really interesting conversation just learning from from these things like okay at that age he already has an idea of a concept of a week and what that that means um that was that was very powerful for me for yeah talking about things that kids understand much earlier than we think they are that's that's yeah. that's definitely yeah. it's um and indeed 
a lot of what we do, they they do, and they they sometimes might do better because. They, but, but you're talking about fights. They were at schools. Yeah, there were some kind of things that they were saying in our time that they would help us coaches. But these kind of tools, they never taught us, or not not me at least. I only learned this like when I was 25 or something like that. So it would have definitely have helped me um, dealing with uh, with things in my in my childhood. I think. Yeah. The, and it, sorry, uh, was, resolving uh, conflict has definitely you know, being changed over the year and the way we do this uh, and also like how it's been accepted in society. So uh, I believe it's a good uh, evaluation, uh, evolution. Uh, evolution, yes. Yeah, definitely. Well, and, and in some sense, that's a lot of what we sometimes do as, as coaches is, is showing the conflict and finding ways how to deal with that. And that's uh, that brings me kind of to that, that second question that uh, if you had not been doing what you do now, what would have become of you? Is there anything that is different that you see? Um, on the age when I had to choose what uh, I had to become, I was like very into computers already. So for me, the obvious choice was to be an engineer. But my father also was a doctor. And mm. it's a different kind of engineering. So I might have chosen the kind of the, the doctor path or the psychology path and i wasn't mm. like really sure on that but that you know maybe that was very soon in, in in my feeling was more about yeah there's there's something on the human level like i always enjoyed psychology and philosophy during my training as an engineer so you had like already that. some training about yeah. that wow yeah. 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 Um, but it was like very thin right it's like one hour mm -hmm somewhere but i was always very engaged to that um but yeah that was might have been a tipping point uh, in a way that uh, uh, i always thought about doing both one after the other but <laughs> i guess <laughs> that was uh, <laughs> uh once well, you, you, i was finished I, I did something else i guess yeah well and at the same time you keep studying and keep learning new stuff and in yeah like you say earlier on the human side is definitely part of devops and so there's definitely a lot of psychology and a lot of things that you learned and picked up along the way not in the same professional way and and lots of other stuff that you could have learned on the other side but um yeah it's it it's it's nice to see that combination. I had no idea that your father was a doctor, so that's definitely also again something I learned. And that well, people yeah. like you say it's 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 engineering, but then at the human body in a sense. So it's yeah. uh, it's it's different kind of engineering. But again, that engineering is one side. What I recall from my father is going on out on a Sunday morning to his patients were in their beds, right? He couldn't go but he would visit them in the morning so they would have somebody that talks to them so the, it, it's kind wow. of it's also psychology it's 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 not a technical thing he needed to do but the fact that he was kind of guiding them and helping them and feeling mm -hmm. empathy for them being alone on a sunday morning and going there right so that that's probably something that was indicative from from kind of combining both even you know in that profession yeah and um, but and um, and in, in a lot of sense, once once we start working with humans, that that it's always there, one way or another. We might not see it, and and uh, there's I think there's lots of research also the fact that even if if after um, when people are in surgery and everything, if if you're much nicer to the patients, there is much difference in in how they heal and and everything. So it's uh, it's it's logical but sometimes in let's say the economics part of of uh, hospitals we don't see it all the time and that, again it's a lot similar that we see in it as well that we sometimes look too much at efficiency and we forget that there is humans using our computer stuff and everything there maybe a final parallel between both worlds when we meet with the family mm -hmm. you probably know this like if they know you're from it they would go to you and i was like oh Ah, right. I can already go to where that story goes. Yeah, but it's very similar to a, like when they know you're a doctor, everything you have on your body, they're like, okay, what is this? What should I do? So anyway, I wanted to throw out that similarities of people coming to you with their 
and need for yeah I, I, I can definitely see that uh, um my my actually my grandfather was was a doctor as well but uh yeah he was we never lived that close and so uh i never um had that sense sense to do that uh and and by the time i was what 14 he died so so uh but i can imagine that my mother would have done similar kind of stuff um when she was visiting uh definitely i can definitely see that happening i basically we see that with all kind of professions i see the same thing with people who are um lawyers and everything there's there's always something that people want to talk about and about <laughs> and they all have uh, that's the other similarity they all have their own kind of lexicon and words that they use that nobody understands and then uh, yeah so we we have that in a lot of uh, things yeah let's move to that next question what is for you currently your your biggest challenge or at least the biggest challenge that that you want to share openly and and why is that a good thing to do uh, i i think um I've reached a point where I've done most of the jobs that I like, like the roles that I wanted to do in a company. Mm -hmm. And I think my struggle currently is, well, is it management or is it not management? Is it technical or not? And um, my spectrum has gotten so broad on the technical level. Um, how do I maintain this and then still keep it interesting because after 13 years, you definitely see some like pendulum swings, like central, decentral, autonomous, central authority. You kind of like you're going, what's kind of keeps uh, it excited? Uh, so it's a challenge for me um, to know. I believe I'm good at the technical side and I, I bring the empathy and the orc knowledge, but then making the tipping point maybe even more to even more organizational even more people management and less technical so that, that that's kind of a, a little bit of, of a challenge for me right now and yeah. that uh, that shows in like what type of job do i need to do like where do i do do my research like what do i read so it's uh, uh yeah it's an interesting challenge yeah and that that yeah I, I, let's say i've seen you well struggle is maybe the wrong word but i've seen you talk and and you're again you're very public about it huh? if you want to you you took a, what is it two three months hiatus this year that you say i want to just dive into certain topics without wanting to choose what i'll do next and then and then afterwards okay now i've done that what's the next step and I'm trying to figure out um yeah. I saw also on your LinkedIn recently, you said what, like 59% is DevOps and 10% is this. And so it shows up in many different ways and, and how you, you look at these things. Um, but at the same time, I think because you're so vocal, it's it's very nice because a lot of people, especially when we look at, at well, you're, you're, you're a public figure in, in the DevOps world and a lot of people think, okay, Patrick did that. and they think then okay that's you have a, a a career path and you know right up front where you want to do no you're in a sense struggling just like everybody else and you're showing it and your struggle is you learn a lot so from when you do these 130 presentations it looks like you know everything up front no and and you're also clear in some of the presentations about all the the screw-ups that you made and all the trying that, that, that thing um but it's still it's it's it, it doesn't matter um, if we're we're older and are gray, having gray hair. You still have some of that struggles, uh, and maybe even more now than than um, than before, because, like you say, you've kind of done all the jobs. So before you could say, "Well, there is that other little job that I still want to figure out." Now you've done it, and now it's like, "Okay, now I need to choose which one I like most." Well, yeah, maybe not. Maybe. And Patrick, um, why is that a good thing for you, that that challenge? Do you have any idea? Is there anything good about that? I think the good thing is that I keep conscious that um, the, when you're a technical person, there's often this mentality, well, whatever is decided in management is, is, is a bad way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And then whenever you're closer to management, it's like, oh, these technical people don't really understand what our directions are. So that that kind of keeping myself on my toes, like 
in whatever level I am, it 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 kind of makes it um, interesting. It's it's uh, sometimes exhausting, I think, but it, it is another level of uh, another bridge, maybe in my mind that I need to bridge uh, between two different worlds. Uh, but I haven't really sorted this out uh, if it's something that fits my personality there. So. But this is why it's still the challenge, of course. And that's that's. Yeah. But that's why it's for me. Sorry, that's why it's, for me it's interesting to share and, and to think about it. Um, and you, you say that it's um, it's exhausting also in the sense that because you you kind of live in both worlds at that moment. Is is this what uh, correct to see? Yeah, it, it's it's like what is um, maybe it's more about going not against but kind of like there's this stereotype thinking. A little bit like when you're management, you're not technical. When you're technical, you're kind of less in management and, and, and kind of how do I fight these stereotypes? And, and again, it shows when you, you try to get hired and they ask me, like, are you a product manager? Well, a little bit. <laughs> are you a manager? Well, a little bit. So it, it's it, it, it's struggling there, uh, mostly with like structures. Um, very similar maybe to what you know, DevOps, that kind of like, okay. I, I was <laughs> thinking what? about you, you have so, some tendency to look at two worlds and trying to bridge them in a way. Yeah? It's, yeah. Uh, I, I see this in a lot what you're doing uh, in, in many things. I know we had many discussions also just about the word DevOps, the fact that it's an upper D and an upper O for you. It's like it's one word that's not the goal is just to, to bridge them, not to have again two, two words. Yeah. Uh, so and that's that I see that in in a lot of the struggles and a lot of the discussions that we have. Yeah. Um, Again, inside, I had recently I was in a, at an event and there was a a junior engineer coming up to me and uh, he wanted in an open space have the discussion about well how do I get to the next level you know I, I want like people on my team to help me but I'm junior so they're not giving me the chance and and kind of. To level up and they always say like well well we'll do it faster ourselves and so he was looking for that career advice so that was kind of his, his part of the thing but i, I wanted to, to go to him and kind of learn about his struggles and, and can we maybe help him uh, and he's you know he asked like what are you doing like what's your title and i say well currently i'm a distinguished engineer and he goes like wow this is kind of you know where i'm aiming at like it's like the full career path uh and what I told him is, I've I've you know had a path, but it's not per se up technically. It's it's a path, and currently I might get, be uh, getting the least technical person in the room again. Mm. And so it it's not about you know ultimately I'm gonna know all the technologies. <laughs> uh, it's but the older versions the things of 10 years ago <laughs> well yes but it's it's kind of like you're balancing between no enough technical stuff to understand the people who report to you or to that help you and then also be able to translate this to to more of a, a kind of vision or a strategy and uh, and he found that insightful that in a way that like oh so you're actually like me, always trying to learn from others. So, like from another direction. Uh, anyway, so I, that was insightful for me as well. Like, hey, we're, we're, I'm I'm almost like back at square zero. <laughs> but in in a sense, that's what I hear from a lot of people that when they first join management, when they they, they become a team lead or anything kind of uh, thing, it's. Um, um, yeah, it's uh, how would I say it? If they first come come management, um, that they, they 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 need to learn again and and learn a lot of stuff that way. It's mm -hmm. um, it's 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 in in that sense. Uh, so that's it, it's it's but it's always like that. Eh? Anytime you achieve something and you think I'm I'm somewhere, then then something else is is popping up again, and. I, I think both you and I were, were a lot similar in the sense that 
if it if we're too long in in a certain role it gets bored in a sense and then we look for that new thing to learn if it's a shiny thing or if it's something we've learned before that we want to relook at that stuff it's um it's it's to get it cited again and in a sense be back at square zero um but but square zero on on a different level and so it's 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 a different square zero <laughs> i don't know it's yeah, you you bring a lot more context to that square yeah. even if it feels like zero you you feel there's a lot more kind of historical knowledge you have and it kind of like makes you more informed decision but it's uh there's the other kind of direction about kind of getting more senior in engineering is that mm -hmm. there's the the contrast between people who don't know a lot of things and they just try which is good and they, they try a lot of stuff uh and more senior engineers would say well hang on <laughs> did you think this true mm -hmm. and then there's the senior who thinks things true but act slower so you might end up ideally or like or not ideally but you might end up being both as fast uh but it, it goes in a different direction uh, and hopefully being more senior prevents some of the failures but it does slow you down uh like yeah. more knowledge as much as it speeds you up so it's it's an interesting contrast between learning more and then learning too much to kind of think things too much too much true yeah because sometimes we might see the possible problems and 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 sometimes we and then they look at all different kind of parts and and then you have someone junior from school that just knows the right part or knows at least a little a little less but but yeah dares to try more um i think a lot of difference there and on what is um, the scale of experimenting how how cheap it is to fail eh? uh if you if you look back at when my father was um and he, my father was one of the first uh, engineers in Belgium working on computers, mainframe and stuff like that. If you screw up a mainframe, I don't know if people were able to do that, but if you would be be able to screw up a mainframe, that's cost a lot of more money than the little uh, Arduinos that are behind my back that are that I blew up. So that's that's a little bit uh, less expensive, and then you can you can try much more if you have expensive hardware or other kind of stuff. So that's. Um, yeah, definitely that, safe that, environment. Exactly. And that's I think we need to work a lot on I think a lot of our work is about creating that safe environment where we can create for ourselves or for others that is it safer to to try out and, and to do some stuff. And that's not always easy. Um uh, because management or others might not understand and might have seen in the past expensive failures. So that's um, just there. Um, I want to go to that next question, and I think we kind of bounce around a lot of things. And I, I think, well, I know you as a very driven person, and I, I know you can drive yourself very far with uh, with in, in dangerous ways. I would even say that you've you've been in in near a burnout at least. I think, um, but do you know where that drive is, that passion is coming from. Do you know that? I know what my passion is. I don't know where, like, I could maybe see where it comes from. So my passion is learning, uh, or something new, and, and and learn enough, but not just for the sake of learning. So I I also feel that I need to experience this. So I I sometimes say I'm a I'm a method actor. I'm a method learner. So I need to absorb myself into that role, into that domain. Um, I think. I'm not sure if it was completely inspired, but you know, if I look at the books my father had and <laughs> what he was reading all the time, and like he was also one of the pr first people doing uh, more like cancer treatments and and so on. So there's been this phenomenal learning from home that it's like you know every time uh, I remember him, it wasn't through internet or something. He had this little book that he would receive every month with new academic articles he would like flag them all and then somebody would type uh, them up on cards and send them to all the people over the world and try to get that document for learning so that kind of wow. drive uh you know probably you know 
maybe inspired me or or it's just my, my so he created his own little community based on on knowledge that he had and that he shared then with people around no, it, it was kind of a, a like a subscription you get from all the articles mm -hmm. around certain topic in in kind of medicine mm -hmm. And then he would mm -hmm. just flag them, was like, please send it to me. Like he, like he, ah, like, yeah, okay, he would okay. get mail of articles, and right, books, right, and right. Everything uh, every day with you know, obviously as a child you look at all the post stamps from Japan, from from wherever. But it, it's kind of like it, the book cases <laughs> my dad had, like everywhere there were books and articles he was reading all the time. Uh, so it might have been inspiration, but. We, I, I'm not sure yet. I, I had an example in that way. You had an example and you saw basically someone in your home who kept learning, who kept reading, who kept looking for things, not just in the local library, but also around the world based on, on these cards and, and everything that he could ask around. Yeah. So that there is definitely a lot of... Uh, and we learn a lot from our examples, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, learning is fun. Um, but uh, I think it's been, it's going out of your comfort zone. Like, you know, if you take a new role, a new domain, you, you, you're, you don't know it. So there's a little bit of preparation. But I now feel that my, my spread to go to a new domain, it needs to be further. So it, it, it takes also more energy uh, to do that. And mm -hmm. on, on your remark on kind of, I, I can really exhaust myself. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. in, in certain ways uh, is that I maybe I'm getting a little bit older and hopefully smarter on that is that I try to do it more in my day job than, than I do it like after hours uh, somehow so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to balance that in my work life more than uh, because what, what happens is the treadmill is you do a certain job and you know what you want to learn and so what you want to do learn, it in the evening on top of it it's kind of like it, it just keeps like a lot of uh, energy that you need to do on this, uh, yeah. And I, yeah, I, well, we had some some conversations over the years. I, I definitely learned a lot from you because I, I still do too much, I think, in my evening jobs. We're talking again in the yeah. evening, <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a nice example. Uh, even if it's if it's a different kind of learning, it still is it still is uh, outside the business hours in in a sense. Um, and I definitely needed to learn that. And I remember talking with you. I, do, I don't remember anymore that you said at a certain conference, well, I can't come or I won't do that because I, I've already committed to too much. And I was like, oh, OK, maybe I should listen also at that level and, and learn from it. Um, I've never been to that far, but I've learned, I think, thanks to you, among others, your example, learn to listen better to my body and, and the treadmill uh, so that, that we're on. I think that's definitely a thing. Well, and if we're talking about all these these drives and all these things, that is also about achievement. So what do you consider your, your biggest achievement? Um, the biggest achievement in a way is that you know, a lot of people give me credit for inventing DevOps. I, I, mm. and, and people would say, well, well, you know, you're just being humble if you say no. It's not that I have invented anything. I think I was, I put my energy in amplifying voices in something I believed in. Mm -hmm. uh, so th that's definitely an achievement, uh, you know, but I, I certainly did not do this alone. But the the biggest pleasure so there's two things there's there's ctos or ceos sending sometimes a, a message on linkedin do you remember when we had the conversation seven years ago you kind of kind of inspired me to do something and then they say we sold our company for a couple of millions we'll buy you a beer right okay you know good for them right <laughs> it's kind of like they made money and it was a good peer <laughs> but uh but occasionally uh, they could have sent you a, a, a bottle of whiskey or something like that, a yeah, little yeah. more. But yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay uh, in this. Exactly. Uh, but when, when people send me a message on LinkedIn or mail, they say, You changed uh, my quality of life in a company, or you made me change my job and it, it, it really improved my personal level. That is something that I'm, I'm really proud of when, when, I, when I read that. Like, what do you make money on top of this? Like, okay, you know, 
you know, I couldn't care less <laughs> in a way. But that that kind of that human side that improved life for you as an as an individual in a company, that 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 is kind of the the biggest reward uh I can get. And it's it's one of those things that um DevOps, the technical side, DevOps, the organizational side, but DevOps, the individual side, you know, kind of the mm -hmm. overload of of things to do, the burnout, the pager, all that stuff. That there's there's definitely something on the individual level uh, that we've achieved as well to improve people's life uh, there as well. So that's kind of what I'm proud of in, in that I I was part of maybe something that helped people get a better life somehow. And it feels now like I'm I'm a cheesy American kind of looking for. Uh, a way to make this emotionally, but it is kind of inspiring in a way that this is uh, this this has happened somehow. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I'm I'm coming from the developer side, and so I, I I've only seen the operational side from from a distance, and I've only been much more in touch since DevOps and and since a lot of that happened. But when I hear the the war stories about people having beepers being called up in the middle of the night and and all that stuff, we we actually deploy much more. We 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 feel less stress, or in most good DevOps organizations, we feel less stress about deploying on a Friday. So we do a lot more of that with a lot less stress. So it's there is there is both parts of it. I would say on on an on an it, it's not just oh we care about the humans and we we ignore the, the technical problems. No, we solve the technical problems in a way that the humans are are maybe the the biggest advantages of it, and yeah. they get people get to stay with their families and and because there's always heroes that like to be called up and then say oh i saved my company and i've been there at night but then there is the if if they don't feel it it's their family that feels it uh in in a sense and and there is that part um it reminds also a little bit about the story of your father that cared about the people but at the same time he was not with you uh, as a family on on a sunday morning as well and so you in a sense we have a similar kind of problem or we had a similar kind of problem in operations that you helped well maybe not solve but at least tell people hey there is a different way and we can look at it and when there were voices that talked about multiple deployments on 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 the night and and whatever and and then we had chaos engineering and all these kind of things you helped raise these voices and get an audience in in that sense yeah and, that, that and energy of promoting and helping again the rest is kind of a lot of zeitgeist you know about people being more vocal about their social uh kind of uh well-being uh, you know, it's not specific to IT. It is in general uh, mm -hmm. in, in society, but but kind of making that, uh, highlighting those stories that it is possible that it's not a pipe dream. I think that's you know where I can be proud of that. I I really helped yeah. uh, to make that. Happen. And and people coming back to you and and telling you and in a sense probably because you talked about that that conversation that the ceo told you on linkedin or whatever about seven years ago most of these stories i'm i'm pretty sure you have already forgotten but people remember talking to you and remember that you changed their life and and the fact that they come back and tell you like hey you made my life better um i have a similar kind of uh, story where i know that at some point um it's not for me but it's um the the wife of uh, the the partner of a of, of a manager comes back to a coach and then says you know that since you have been doing this that that our marriage has become better because he's a better person and and whatever that's the kind of thing where you say well it's touched lives so that's the kind of stuff that that we're talking about huh? that's that's something to be really proud of yeah and i think thank you for sharing well for uh, being a coach right it's like a lot of coaching is uh you could say well it's about the process but it's also on the individual level uh trying to improve them as a person so yeah it's 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 it, like we well it's it's linked in in yeah. all different kind of ways huh? it's uh yeah there is definitely that i want to move to that next question where um do you have a personal agility tip to share anything that you want to share with uh, the audience here? 
Um, I would say never use the word DevOps, but that's probably not going to happen. Um, but what I mean is that um, you you, you got to keep the focus on the real problem. And the, um, what I've seen over and over again is that, uh, let's say, people take the deployment issue that we're not releasing too often, and, and they dive in and they, they, they like spend a lot of effort to do this, um, but they keep going on this. It's like, no, it's not enough. Like one deploy, no, it needs to be 50. Like it needs to be a hundred. And, and what they kind of sometimes forget is when you solve a certain problem or a bottleneck, let's call it a bottleneck or like an issue, um, the whole system changes and the problem might change to a different location, maybe in your control, maybe outside your control, maybe in another company, maybe in HR, like, and, and keeping that mindset, like, are we, we've solved the problem, but when do we stop? And, and that's kind of a, coming back to my just enough model. Like, mm -hmm. like, if we fix this well enough, do we need to continue just for the sake of continuing and making it better? Or is there something else that we should be working on? And it's something I experienced in maybe in the startup we had, like, okay, we solved something technically, but are we hiring the right people? Oh, we don't have enough customers. <laughs> oh, like worse, because we didn't have customers, we couldn't hire people and we couldn't do our technical stuff. And, and so it's like a relationship um, as an example, uh, but even within- I, I like it. I like it that as Focus on the right problem. Eh? It's, 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 it's uh, like you say, and I think this is one of the advantages that you have of having work both in technical as in management that you can you can put on the right hat or try to put on the right hat, uh, and it's it's challenging like like anything. Uh, but 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 it's good to to indeed every time we solve something to to take a, a little moment to reflect. Okay. What's now the biggest problem? Is it still the same thing and we need to go from one deploy to 50 deploys? Or is it now we need to make sure that whatever there is a, enough bandwidth or that there is another problem? Or like you say, now that we now that we fixed the, the deployment problem, let's first make sure that we have customers because going going from an automatic deploy from nothing to an automatic deploy without customers okay maybe we should first start doing customers and we can still do the manual deploy for for the one customer that we have and and not try to automate it with 50 engineers without having money because then we run into another kind of problem and you spend you or your partner spends all the time talking with the bank to solve a, a money issue because that's that's an, and that's the kind of problem you try to avoid to have. Yeah. It's I, I like that. It's it's um it's it's yeah, it, it puts the balance on the right thing. So thank you for sharing that because it's something that uh, a lot of us sometimes forget. We're so much deep into solving our problem that once we solve it, we're in a tunnel vision and we want to dive deeper in it because in I, especially in IT, every time you solve it, you can solve it in a better way, in a faster way, in a cheaper way, in whatever. But okay, is that still the thing to solve? That's that's a really good one. Mm -hmm. Let's move to um, a similar kind of tip and, and completely different. What have you learned? And I know you've been working remote for, for years, like uh, even with your startup, you had customers in, in multiple locations and, and stuff like that. But um, and and COVID and everything. So, what what is there anything you can teach us about remote working? Hmm. Um, I guess by now we we feel that a lot is possible uh, with remote working. I'd say, like many of us, we learned that sometimes working remote needs to be compensated by getting people together again at certain times to at least build some history, some kind of cohesion that you it's hard to get uh, through the screen. So, but but that's kind of not new. Um, one of the things I, I did learn early on about working remote is it's really hard when your team is not all remote or, or able to do it remote. Uh, and by that, by that, I mean, imagine 90% of the team is on site in, 
10% is remote, it's, it's really hard to make that cohesion. Uh, like they might be at the water cooler discussing stuff and you're not there. And it even gets worse if you're in a different time zone, right? So my tip there would be if you're in that kind of uh, situation is almost uh, what we did uh, at Atlassian is, is get a buddy that is on site but actually cares about you and being remote. Um, mm. That really helps in kind of, well, you weren't there, but you know, uh, I'll brief you afterwards or get your insights and he gets to know you better. So if, if you're in this kind of unbalanced situation on site and remote, that, that's one tip I would have there. So. I, I like that and it, it reminds me of, well, for example, if I go on a conference or whatever, uh, or even just, just yesterday, this, uh, this, we are recording this on the 2nd of September. So the 1st of September, I was not home. My, my daughter goes to the first day of school. And so I, I'm basically have to ask my buddy, my partner, in the sense that once she got home, okay, were there war stories or stories shared that, uh, that is interesting to know and, in, in many cases, we don't share them because we think, yeah, it's just chit chat or whatever, but it, you miss out on an important part. Like you said, the water cooler history, this is where history is made. This is where the war stories are shared. And sometimes when things are solved, we think that we don't need to know it, but it's actually very good to have a buddy that tells you about, well, you know, this is the kind of thing because then the next time you see that person, you can ask a little more of, about these kind of things. Uh, and so that's 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 yeah. I recognize that the, having a buddy for these kind of things can can really really help. That's, yeah. uh, it's it's almost like a proxy owner, right? Kind of a proxy who knows. Oh yeah, translating. So it's very similar, but for technical discussions or anything there. That I, I almost forgot that name, proxy owner. I mean, yeah, that's uh, that's from the old XP days that we use. Yeah. That now we call it a product owner, but yeah. uh, that uh, no proxy customer it was. Proxy yeah, yeah. customer yeah. it was. Uh, it was yeah. I forgot completely about that name. That's uh, and that was useful uh, and sometimes more useful than we sometimes the way we look at at um, at the product owner. But that brings us to a whole different discussion that I want to <laughs> want to open. I want to move to, uh, you talked already about books that your father read. So what is a book that you read either recently or that you say, this is something really I would advise more people to, to that I learned from or anything that you want to talk about? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm a serial reader. Um, mm -hmm. I, I buy books uh, by the dozens just to learn a new domain. I just buy five books. But one Book that's and wait, 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 let's let's go a little bit into that. Do you read them then all cover to cover, or do you just read until okay, this is not good enough. Let's move to the next one. Or how do, how does that work for you? Um, so it's mostly when I'm like learning something new, I would mm -hmm. buy five or six books from that domain, and the books help me actually to understand the domain language better. So I'm not reading them cover to cover. Like maybe the first one I'll, I'll read more in depth, but then in the next book, there might be a lot of overlap. So I'm like skim through. And and I'm also not the person who lines things and kind of like, you know, puts mm -hmm. the remarks. It, it's uh, I, I do that maybe in a, an organic way. Like if it doesn't stick, it doesn't stick. And I'm okay mm -hmm. with like not having the depth, but it's a And, and keep, do you keep the books around so that you can go back to it? Or do you do then it's um, just... I, I used to buy physical books, but there's not enough room for that. <laughs> so I'm just Kindle and I buy and I buy and I just uh, read. So uh, just, uh, and, and somehow it, there's still room on the Kindle every time there is. For sure. But it's about, about absorbing the global ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different on technical things, maybe, you know, where, where it's very specific. Uh, but on the global ideas, if the ID doesn't stick after skimming through, uh, or like, you know, maybe some more detailed reading, uh, that's fine. Um, but again, it's different when you're maybe, uh, when it's in the adjacent field, you can skim it. It's like fast reading. If you know a little bit of the content, you, you kind of look. Oh, yeah. So you, so yeah. you go, you broaden your scope a little bit and every time you add a little bit because you already know some yeah. parts of it. Yeah, yeah. Right. But sometimes it's also like, you're new, you're zoning in on what's the global vision. 
and then you after five books you know like oh these concepts are interesting you move maybe like youtube what's happening there and then youtube you found like oh that's an interesting you can do a good explanation what about the blog so i kind of go down from a top-down yeah. broad view but i find that books are the most efficient way to kind of get that broad view i could search and 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 kind of um use google but it it's not very efficient if you don't know the right keywords so the books give me keywords well, and what i always say keywords. is that for me books an author has done the should have done the work for you to to get something and of course you can learn everything from from reading 100 blog posts but you need to find the right blog posts you need to put them into context and a good author has done that has done that work he's done he worked three years hard on that to make sure that it's it's coherent not all authors do that that's another problem <laughs> but but the good author has done that it should be able to read it and to skim it and and that's that is indeed um yeah i i recognize that that if i want to learn something new i don't buy five books but i definitely buy one book and and before i finished it i've already bought two other books that <laughs> i might not finish uh yeah, indeed yeah. just to because in that book there is a reference to another book that actually you think well maybe this was the one i should have read and yeah okay okay i interrupted you so i wanted to talk about one book specific yeah, one book specifically is calling Reinventing Organizations uh, from Frederick. This Lalu. one? Yep. Got that right. <laughs> uh, and I think what I find interesting um, on that book is I was looking to delve in more on autonomous teams and, and kind of like why is this kind of now picking up more than before. And in, mm -hmm. in this book, there is a, a diagram that talks about the different almost like social collaboration organizations uh, ways uh, it, it starts off very basic uh, you know in the middle ages when people uh, are in or out the castle and that's all about mm -hmm. like we create security <laughs> you're in and you're out and like everything's from within the walls or outside the walls and then we we, we kind of uh, found more or, or let, let's say different ways of organizing like in a factory uh we're, we're kind of automating things right it's not just about creating the security in and out it's like okay well, let's how we improve and then there was the whole idea like if we automate everything everything is kind of like getting better but that wasn't mm -hmm. enough and then we had like oh what about we we need to put metrics <laughs> to measure how well we're doing on the collaboration on uh, kind of the process um and and the book keeps coming up into um, oh what about we create a service <laughs> a service is more customer oriented than just measuring uh, and then ultimately they they went into the level of more autonomy and and kind of uh, you know making sure there's a uh, something that like drives you and you care about as a team but don't do all the rest and then it evolves more into ethics and why we're doing these things mm -hmm. as a way uh, so like the ultimate or not i shouldn't say ultimate because that's not right but many people may think that the books goes to a length to say well they, they give each of these way of collaboration a color and the ultimate for them i have the, the example yeah. here yeah. The yeah, so they this... call the, the teal organization uh, is, is another term that comes up uh, in that way. Um, and actually, the book goes through a lot of lengths to say it is not per se one is better than the other. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow a lot of people still perceive this huh? in that way. Yeah, we need to right. go to teal. And yeah. Yeah, no. yeah. But what was interesting for me from, from reading that book is that like something clicked that when you go into any organization you will find remnants of all these collaboration cultures some people would swear about we need to measure everything <laughs> some people would swear about going automation some are like it's in or it's out and 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 that that's kind of an observation in my mind like all these collaboration uh, ways are 
very much ingrained into any company and uh, they manifest in different ways. And it's a balance between these different attention points that that, that kind of makes uh, it interesting. Um, and then the second part that I, I kind of learned from it is um, whenever you focus on one of these collaboration types, there is a paradox that bites you back in the end. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um you know uh we often say if people start with metrics and they they are solely focused on the metrics eventually those metrics will get gamified and they mean nothing right mm -hmm. uh, and it's you know maybe in another parallel world if people are not secure they care a lot about security they do a lot about security and once they're secure they care less about security <laughs> if if a company says we're all about the customer we're all about services what I've seen mostly in SaaS companies, this is how they start. Eventually, they say, these are the five types of customers that pay us the most. <laughs> We're going to go for them. It's not about all the customers. So there, there's kind of this paradoxes that like whenever we improve something and that might tie, tie back into you know the, 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 the bottlenecks discussion is like you, you kind of optimize for one and then it pulls you back into, oh, well, <laughs> that, that's not the end goal. The end goal is to balance all of these kind of collaboration uh, methods and values, but not to go wildly in on, on one. So anyway, that, that was kind of my takeaway uh, on the book. So I, the I like, is, yeah. I like that, that view a lot because it reminds me and I'm looking about if I find the book, but I don't see it. I know it's somewhere there, but the, there is a book that I read that I learned from, from Stan de Knut uh, or that I worked with him on a workshop about learning organizations. And strangely enough, they use scholars as well, uh, completely different. But what, what is interesting that they say is that if you want to do it in a transformation agile or whatever, that you have different ways of doing it. And, and there is a lot that I hear from you. There are certain people who care about, OK, we should first prepare it correctly and then model everything. And, and, then, and then there's others just go with it. And or we should only care about the people and so and you have all of these and and depending on on where you want to go and and with who you talk in the organization you need to look at the different ways of doing that and an agile transformation or another kind of transformation another any kind of change you cannot just focus on one part if in 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 the old ways you could have say okay it's upper management that says let's go there and then everybody followed these days that doesn't work anymore but if you only work from the people and you don't care about management, you will lose at a different level. And so that's that's all that similar kind of thing. I, I thank you for bringing that up about about the the models because I've seen a lot of people struggle with that book. I, I think most people love the book, uh, but it, it it is hard. How do you do it now in practice? What you can learn with it? What you can do with it? And it's uh, and I think you bring in an important part there. It's like it's it's not just about well, like what he says in what uh, he says in the book about not going for one optimal thing, but it's you you bring it even down a level a notch in the sense that you say basically all these levels are there one way or another, and right. maybe at, at some point we we want to avoid some parts, but even if you want to. You have to realize that there are people in the organization that do this for a certain reason and that care about a certain way of working. And they had their their reasons why why we did it. A little bit like you said about security. Yeah. At some point, security is important. If you if if it's it's about basic things, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's all about drive and everything. We should follow our passion, but if we're not making the money to survive well for, i don't care about passion i first need to have money to have food on the table and if yeah. that means i have to work three jobs then i won't care about your passion at all i will work my three jobs to make the money that i need to do yeah. and it's it's a very privileged situation if you can say let's go for for the passion well that means you have been to already a lot of stages there yeah um, and it, it does bring up the fact that you say uh, earlier on the call on you know, a safety for learning. Um, and as much as you could say, well, you know, costals and defending and the kind of making sure, but in a way that costal was about keeping the people safe. Uh, exactly. Allowed the rest to kind of flourish. But if you don't have that safety, 
then then all the rest was kind of yeah not happening uh, in the there is a reason why there was a castle basically yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it's and 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 it's and 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 it's it's a reason why that castle was a safe and uh, because I assume all the castles that are no longer there they're probably unsafe and they were taking over and whatever so they they didn't do the job that they were supposed to do so uh, it was a different world um, and and that's that's the same thing about the what you talk about you make the bridge between two worlds there was a reason why there was a certain world at a certain time operations was important for for yeah. doing that deployment and 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 uh, yeah and it's a different world and it's good that it i i like what when when you, when you look back at a lot of what you do you always look back at like you said it's again the focus what's the biggest problem if that biggest problem is keeping things safe well maybe we should keep more the upside and and let's keep it separate from from death and and let's yeah. let's let's first fix that part and only when that is solved we can talk about working together and preferable we do it already in collaboration but if if there is no safety in that company or whatever reason then maybe that's not the problem to solve yeah it's one uh, of the things that that uh somebody reminded me where we're talking about oh well you know after 13 years of devops what's new and he made me realize uh thank you yellow for that if you're listening um the context has changed so the solutions we've been advocating in DevOps might change. And, and the example I give is when we started out having this discussion about Dev and Ops need to work together, it was all about like you're in one group and you're in the other and we, we are not allowed to talk to each other. I think in, in a lot of companies, this this has been solved and, and, and we have mm -hmm. the narrative of, oh, you should collaborate on, on certain things. Um, and that you know brought up a pipeline and, and different various ways of, of working this. But now we've moved, oh, well, you know, it's not the central IT team who says how it needs to be done. Each team has like a, a, an authority to do this. And now the pendulum has swung in a way that, oh, well, if everybody does their own thing, there's an overload of all the knowledge you need to have. There's an overload of all, all the things you need to do in your own team. So where's that balance? So, you know, the whole discussion about a platform team, a platform tooling, dev experience. Uh, and, and that's kind of something that I keep in my mind is like whatever we've been discussing earlier, if the context and the mentality and the zeitgeist has changed uh, on certain topics, like, are we still being relevant in how we're solving this? And 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 it's a large spectrum. Some are still at their the, the beginning of their journey, and some are not. And some have the history, and some have not. But it, it's a fascinating thing to to look at it on the on the longer historical scale. Uh, what has changed in the organizations in a modern organization that will cre require us to rethink the way we we collaborate. Uh, in that new context, uh, in that new given org structure or social structure in an organization. Yeah, I, I like that. Uh, I like that very much. It, I've listened to a podcast this week from Tom Klaassen's uh, on, on CTOs, but it's a Dutch one, So, but I'll link definitely to it. And there was someone else, I think it was Stephen Newells, uh, talking about um, the exact same thing about DevOps. Well, we're we're living in a different world. It's the stack has has changed. It it, it talked also about yeah full stack engineers. If we look back fifteen years, twenty years ago, it was possible, kind of possible, to be a full stack and know everything. And now that's like just just knowing everything about Java is well. It's already impossible, not even talking about all the different kind of frameworks that are there. To, so even a full stack team is almost impossible. And, and then learning about the deployment and all these kind of things. So we need to look at different kind of problems and, and, and look at what, what are the things. And in some ways it's like, okay, there's a company that solved that problem. Just, just well, we'll, we'll deploy on Amazon and they solve a lot of problems for us because they deal with it. Where before I had to have my own server and, and do everything. So that's, and yeah. that brings completely different kind of problems with it. Yeah, it's something that I uh, I found a couple of years very interesting. Um, we, you know, early DevOps, we were advocating, please put your ops team very close to your development team and on the same floor and ideally in the same team. 
And then all of a sudden we started doing more in the cloud and the SaaS company. And we were collaborating with a team outside our control, not within our company. And how does that communication happen? And you see communication had changed. The way they do was they do postmortems on the website. They write communication. You meet them at conferences. You, you kind of have a support contract that is all about doing, like getting to know what's on the roadmap. And, and that co collaboration forum was weird in a way. Like we've been advocating so long. And then all of a sudden, like the opposite yeah. side. <laughs> so it, it's uh, what I call uh, the um, the supplier to an organization. You know, you, so we mm -hmm. talk a lot about supply chain these days and in, in kind of like security in the build pipeline. But the suppliers, the third parties, the services that we're using, we need to establish a relationship with them as well. So, and and coming back to what if your bottleneck is. In those companies, you have no authority, you have no way, but maybe you have to re-architect the way that you can move to another company quite easily. Uh, think about hybrid clouds or any way there. So you, you see some of these mm -hmm. uh, balancing yeah, and, and changing to a new org structure, to a new way of collaborating with suppliers, and, and, and that's kind of fascinating to see. And then, then it brings me back to some of the discussions we have with with Chris from Inuit about okay, it should be uh, open source companies that at least you can maybe even change a little bit, have a look in the code, and not depending on whatever. But even there, you might be depending on uh, an open source project that has just one developer that, for whatever reason, is mad at the community and pulls away all his sources, and now the whole internet is down for whatever reason. <laughs> <laughs> or uploads a new version that is not compatible with for for that. So there's a lot of things that um, that were. If you just look at that for 15 years, that 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 the landscape has completely changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the reliance on open source, the reliance on the community uh, for crucial parts in our company, uh, and then you know we we shout that there's a security issue and that volunteer who does it in his spare time needs to fix all the security issues it, it it doesn't make sense but what does make sense is to well you know if you're using this a company should contribute back and kind of help these people and, and kind of support them and have a strategy that they are becoming you know uh, equal suppliers and and kind of get some money and support to, to do their job uh, in a good way so uh, anyway, yeah, again, and, well, and, and do your due diligence before that. It's not just developers that select that one tool that depends on yeah. one person, but make sure as a company that you look at it and say, well, okay, maybe this this might be a little bit easier to integrate as a developer, but it's a business risk because then you're talking again, not no, no longer as a technical person, but as a manager about this is a business risk that we're depending. The full stack is depending on that one small little developer that nobody else knows that. That that we don't support. Okay, we can give back and we can we can give code, we can give money, but still, it's one one developer. Maybe that other team with ten people, they they might move faster also in the future. So so let let's look in that. So that yeah, okay, we can keep on talking about all of these things. So let's let's move on. the The question that I want to ask is is uh, that for me is one of the most interesting ones. Is what question do you think I should also ask you, and and what's that answer? Oh, I can think of a million things you should not ask me, but um... <laughs> ah, I didn't think about that question. But yeah, let's 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 not go in that direction. The one thing you can't ask me is about like what is the future of DevOps. Uh... <laughs> I, I, I assume that many people keep asking you and that even if I would ask you by the time this this is is, is out you have already a different answer and uh, and that doesn't help us in a sense so yeah. let's uh, let's it, maybe in a way and, and that's just maybe me picking up on a new domain so maybe like uh, <laughs> picky bagging on this but I'm uh, I'm exploring a little bit around the metaverse in general Mm -hmm. uh, and um, what I find fascinating as being in IT so long is that I I just don't know how the technology it's being built on, like anything on the more AI and the visuals and kind of all that stuff is, is working. So it, it's fascinating to me that like a cross combination of almost like visual effects to graphical interfaces, 3D, 
uh, AI to generate humans to make more uh, like the more realistic is is a complete field that we're shut out of in in our daily jobs and it's not in our realm but on the other side it's something that maybe in the future we'll need to work on more and understand more and and there's again you know maybe i'm just taking that a divide between those two worlds uh and like what what does a mean for b uh, so anyway if, and, if and do they know our tools because do nope. they use yeah that that's that's what i mean basically <laughs> they they we don't know them but they don't know what we do it's a little bit like in the beginning ops not using source control system for for building the infrastructure and everything i hear the same thing about ai models and everything they don't use any of our tools about and i'm, I'm not saying that they should use the same tools for version control but they should have some kind of version control yeah. and think about that and it feels like they're they have to learn all these things again yeah but um, also they have a different set of problems like they have binaries so big <laughs> Uh, that are not uh, in your regular version control. They cannot do this simple flip over to another server. No, the people are live, and 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 it's like interrupting a video stream. It, it like it's it's not that easy. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of challenges there, and and I think the other part is um, more on the social impact. Uh, like, what does it mean for us uh, in how we're using this and and there's a whole concept around digital twins, which, you know, a lot of people just equate metaverse with, you know, meta as the company, but there's so much stuff that, that is happening, uh, that we're not aware of on how to create better buildings, how to visualize this, how to do simulations of, of whole cities that like we could learn uh, from when we're, we're doing our IT work anyway. So that's, it's, something else so if, if people are interested in kind of you know sending me ideas or like pointers or books or anything there uh and i'm i'm sharing this and and that's why you said like my my profile is like i think well like 75 percent devops and some percent of metaverse and then erratic but 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 that's kind of like yeah as a global term i'm 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 trying to understand better that world on a technology level and then see how we can like learn from whatever is moving there uh, and I'm not talking about NFTs and kind of like, you know, making it like a, a promotion world or a marketing world. It's more like, okay, what, what can we learn? On a technical level or yeah, on yeah. a technical level. And, and it's, it's like you said, this is why I said they probably won't use our version control, but they might need something in with that same ID. It's definitely a different tool. It's a different, it might even be a different concept, but still that you're able to, because you're constantly live, how do you, yeah have versions how you can come back and and yeah experiment again and and do all that kind of stuff and and yeah it's i i it makes me remind a lot about well when i was young when my from my parents a lot of things were different for for now we we have my 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 daughter was born the the year that the iphone came out so for her smartphones are everywhere all the time so she's she's yeah thinking pictures and videos much more she's it, it's at a different kind of level uh and and that's an, yet another level that uh for the people who are born this year will um will be in touch at that level that's uh, a different kind of thing so that's uh, there is a lot to learn there i definitely agree there okay um for me the the last question is about um who should i ask next who do you think is uh, is good uh, to ask next um so you asked me this question ahead of time and uh i gotta be honest i forgot the two names but there's uh the mob mentality podcast folks uh and uh what i really like is how they put this uh what in my head the next level from you know pair programming to mob programming and ensemble programming and they're doing such a great job by it um popularizing explaining this the value of a whole team working on together at the same time so it it like when we tried it in us company it was it blew my mind in a way that like the effect that it has on the team again on the well-being on the understanding on the social cohesion of the team but also on the technical level that like knowledge is shared we learn from each other 
so definitely, you know, there are interesting people uh, to talk to uh, on that subject. Uh, I, I like that. I like that. And I forgot to, to write down the names as well. So the, it's a bad preparation in, in that side. But um, yeah, it's um, what they're discussing. And indeed, if, there is so much more to learn in, in ensemble programming. Uh, and I, I recognize that I'm, I'm still working sometimes with clients that struggle with pairing and how how that brings, even though I would say almost our full environment and everybody around, policemen are working with two. If you're looking in television, there's definitely always two, two presenters um, on the radio, there's two. So in many things, we're, we're working with two and, and still in IT, it's sometimes hard to, to, sell, to sell it. And now in IT, we're going a step beyond with ensemble programming. And I hear the same thing every time again, that teams at first are like, well, let's try for whatever reason and let's do it for the hard stuff or when we work with new stuff and then it blows people's minds. And then very quickly, the teams that dare to try it will just do it full time because there's so much knowledge sharing, so much better quality and, and they're delivering much more which is very strange for a lot of people to learn. And, and that, that is indeed good to, to share much more. Uh, so thank you for uh, inviting them and we'll, uh, we'll get to that. Okay, I want to, uh, if people want to contact you, Patrick, what's the right way, where, where can they find you? So my uh, regular bursts of ID stream is on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle And that's uh, this one. one. Oh, you, you had it prepared? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yes, I have. The... Uh, I'm, I'm pretty um, flexible on communication, so you can find my details on my website, jedi.be, uh, pun intended. Uh, and, you know, if you send me an invite on link with a nice request, then that, that's also the same name. That's so, the LinkedIn, so that's the one I prepared. I was looking for your blog and... Um, Instead, while I want to add it, I came across and I didn't know. I just uh, discovered today that you have a Wikipedia page only in French, as far as I know. And I thought, OK, so I'll, I'll put it there. There's not much there. So if people want to add some more about Patrick with everything you learned today, you can add that. Uh, I, I thought I, I had no idea. I don't know if you knew about it, but it's. Uh, yeah, uh, people do strange things. <laughs> exactly. So. This is for your 15 minutes of fame that you can uh, you can uh, share with your children or whatever the, your grandchildren <laughs> one, one day. <laughs> no, but... <laughs> no, yeah, that, that that's the kind of thing that they they don't care about. That. They keep us humble, so it's good. Exactly, it's that's that's the one thing. Okay, thank you for your time. It's uh, as as always been very very um, inspiring to to have that conversation. Um, and I'm pretty sure that we'll run into each other again at some conferences or try to not organize another DevOps Kent and then still be drawn into that in a couple of years, uh, whatever we'll see about that. Um, but uh, I'm happy to keep you, um, to, to keep in, in touch and, and to keep talking about this. So, yeah, and thank, thank you very much. All the work you're doing and to get all these stories out, uh, really appreciate that work. Definitely. You're welcome. I, I like well it's it's if I keep talking and having conversations like today, that's we, how like I know said, it. yeah, <laughs> that's the, the, the goal was like we said, we, we tried to keep it to, to one hour and yeah, I'm afraid we, we we blew up at that level, but it was an interesting conversation again. So it's at the end. I could say now like speed it up by one and a half, but you won't hear it till the end. Yeah, well, I, I have to admit, I have to listen to these videos three times for editing and other kind of things, and I speed it up if I if I have to the editing. So that's definitely so. If people uh, can still do that, usually it's possible. Okay, thank you for for your time, and let's uh, let's keep in touch. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for watching. Who's Agile? Where the stories of agilists come to life. I hope you liked today's interview. Subscribe if you're not subscribed and want to get to know other Agilists.